Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Molly Alawade, and I'm the Director of Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the question box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credit. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Without further ado, allow me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Cam Kalantar. Dr. Kalantar is a triple board certified physician who studied medicine in Germany and received his MPH and PhD degrees in epidemiology from the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. He trained at SUNY Brooklyn and the University of California, San Francisco, and is board certified in nephrology, internal medicine, and pediatrics. Dr. Kalantar is currently a professor and chief of nephrology and hypertension at the University of California, Irvine. He has authored over 600 publications and has received several grants from the National Institutes of Health. He is a member of the International Steering Committee for World Kidney Day and the immediate past president of the International Society of Renal Nutrition and Metabolism. Thank you, Dr. Kalantar, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor for me and a unique privilege to be part of this uh, uh, program under the uh, uh, American Kidney Fund, uh, a renowned and credible uh, entity that is that has been serving uh, kidney patients uh, uh, and their cause over the past several decades. Uh, I would like also to welcome uh, all colleagues uh, and persons who are uh, connecting and attending this program. Uh, I will present uh, the data uh, which are supposed to be at the uh, language uh, so that uh, everybody understand. I will present this data in the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes so that we can have time for discussion. So I, I myself, as Molly kindly uh, introduced me, I'm a physician and nephrologist. And among others, by providing care to CKD patients, in, that means patients who have chronic kidney disease, uh, I have gained uh, uh, keen interest in their dietary uh, questions. And not infrequently, almost uh, Always, a patient asked uh, what to eat and what not to eat. And uh, when somebody has chronic kidney disease, by going uh, uh, on the internet, so looking uh, at the keyword chronic kidney disease in Google and other search engines, the uh, another keyword potassium comes up, not infrequently. So, what is potassium? Potassium is the element number 19 in the periodic chart. And it's a mineral, and it's a, uh, it's a soft metal. However, it's very important for life. Potassium needs to exist abundantly inside the cell so that the uh, life could exist. The concentration of potassium inside the cell is 30 to 40 times higher than the fluid surrounding the cell. And this is the... Uh, is the so-called gradient, the differential that determines a lot of things. So here I'm going to repeat what is written here. Potassium is a mineral, is an element, number 18. It's found in most foods and it's needed for us. It's, it's a vital and important element. 
and it plays critical roles. Now, when potassium level is much higher inside the cell than in outside of the cell, that differential, that gradient, could help regulate a number of things, including in animals, including human beings, the muscle contractility. For us to be able to use our muscles to move is dependent on this gradient. That means potassium in the, inside the cell, inside your millions of cells, should be much, much higher than potassium outside, which is the blood, the surrounding fluid, including your blood. So therefore, if the potassium inside this, the blood is slightly higher so that the gradient is disturbed, there could be a problem with the muscle. And among others, an important muscle in the body is heart muscle. The entire heart is a muscular entity. And the conducting system of the heart, that means beating and uh, regulations of this uh, heart beating, is dependent on all these fine-tuning mechanisms, hence the role of potassium. So the, the statement here that you see that uh, American Kidney Fund colleagues uh, helped also to improve these slides, it helps your heart to beat the right way. Very important. So now you see also on the uh, figure on the right side, uh, the benefits of potassium boost nervous system, maintains optimal fluid balance, improves bone health and muscle tissue growth, Keep brain functioning normal and prevent stroke. Uh, studies have shown that adequate amount of potassium in intake is very important for the, the nervous system health and cardiovascular health. Maintains electrical con conductivity in the brain and stabilizes sugar. And other important thing is that if you don't have adequate potassium intake, uh, especially those without kidney disease, they, they are more susceptible to diabetes, for example, and hypertension. And we talked about muscle and nerve, con uh, nerve conduction. So let's move on to the next slide. So the key word that not infrequently our patients hear is hyperkalemia. Now, potassium in medieval Latin language is also called calium or calium. So K is potassium. So potassium is K, K is potassium. Uh, and in English language, we say potassium. For example, in some other languages, such as in Germany, the potassium is called uh, kalium. Therefore, kalemia means potassium in the blood, and hyperkalemia means higher potassium in the blood. Now, uh, we didn't write the numbers here for you, but your doctors, but, or if you have been a CKD patient, by now, probably you know that the level of potassium in the blood is between 3.5 and 5.3 millimoles or millicolons per liter. Now, it's not very difficult to uh, remember this because 3.5 and then you reverse that, 5.3. So 3.5 is the lowest number. We may not have even lower than that, and we shouldn't even reach that low level. That's called hypokalemia. And 5.3 is hyperkalemia. So we didn't put these numbers to avoid uh, causing confusion, but I would like to, in, to encourage all patients to be on top of it. That means go and see your numbers. Always uh, uh, show interest and discuss it with your doctors, dietitians, and nurses. Said, look, I know my potassium level. It was 5.1. It was 5.8. So that they know you really know and understand. Then they really... And when they see that a patient is uh, more engaged, they, they pro provide you even more focused care. And if potassium level is above 5.3, for, for instance, in some institutions above 5.1, based on uh, how sensitive you would like to be with hyperkalemia, it's called hyperkalemia, high potassium in the blood. And the most common cause of high potassium level is the kidney disease. That's the heartbreaking part of my field and all of us. And, and uh, once we have a problem, we need to deal with that. We need to accept it. We need that. So we're here to say that having chronic kidney disease not infrequently leads to high potassium level, but not always. So that's how you first acknowledge the challenge. And then together, we team up to work out uh, and find ways to work uh, and resolve this. So that this not lead to 
uh, 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 other problems and misunderstanding. Now, lowering potassium should be there for a long-term goal. That means, and I would also would have added another keyword, that's a team work. We team up together, patient and healthcare providers to do that. Next slide. So, as I said here during the last two slides, or, or especially uh, during the last slide when I mentioned the keyword chronic kidney disease, if you have kidney disease, you are at risk for high potassium levels. Now, the good thing that we put here in this slide, it says we are at risk. You should not assume that if you have kidney disease, you 100% you have high potassium levels. No. Please be careful. Uh, a lot of my patients, they go again online and say that, look, uh, you told me, or my physician told me I have chronic kidney disease from none. I can't eat anything that has potassium. That is usually a misconception, misunderstanding. We say that you are at high risk for this, but it's not 100%. And if you work together, you will not hopefully have those very high levels. You will not have the risk and you will continue to enjoy healthy food and diet. So that's essentially something that uh, we're going to discuss in the next 20 minutes when we are done in 20 minutes from now. So if you have kidney disease, you are at risk for high potassium because your kidneys cannot remove extra potassium. However, that doesn't happen 100%, especially if we put together the goals and, and the uh, uh, targets and how we can resolve this or how we can even prevent this without, before it becomes a problem. Next one. So I tried very hard to put some of the uh, uh, manifestations, some of the symptoms of high potassium. I'm going to say sadly high potassium is not felt by patients. And you may say, well, if my potassium is high, how come I never feel that? But some patients, they feel <clears throat> a little bit of weakness, which happens actually more with low potassium than high potassium. Some people feel slightly more nauseated, a little bit more cramps on and off. We are, even that is not quite sure. And, and there could be some uh, heart beating uh, issues. That means the palpitation things that some patient says, look, my heart is, is beating now too slow. And is it because of high potassium? Now, most of the time, as a chronic kidney disease patient, including those on dialysis, you don't have any symptoms. And, and you may say, how come? Well, think of diabetes. Most of the time, your blood sugar is high. You don't even feel that, right? Unless it's very high or very low. Hypertension. Most of the time, your blood pressure could be very high. You don't even feel anything. So potassium, high potassium is also <clears throat> nothing unusual to that end. That means having a problem that could be that could be quite serious, <clears throat> yet <clears throat> yet there is no or or minimum symptoms. So so therefore, this slide should not be misunderstood. That definitely I'm going to have these pro these manifestations. If I don't have muscle twitches, that means my potassium is normal. No, that happens in rare circumstances most of the time you're not going to have any of these signs or symptoms except for measuring potassium in your blood and finding is high. One thing, however, is very important, and as you see in this cartoon, is the EKG or ECG, right? That means the cardiogram, electrocardiogram. We run that including in the clinic, dialysis, in the dialysis unit, in the ambulatory clinic when someone's potassium is high or we send uh, uh, yourself, or any other patient to emergency room immediately said, look, your potassium is high, you don't feel it, the blood level is high, let's have an EKG to see there are signs. And we look at those EKGs, uh, readings to see if it has affected the, the heart contractility and heart uh, rhythm, because then that could be even more risky. All right, so in summary, just uh, be careful that uh, there might not be any sign. However, we need to ensure that potassium has not started causing uh, serious heart issues. Next slide. 
So therefore, given the fact that uh, a very high potassium or suddenly increased potassium, that means fluctuations in potassium could cause uh, heart issues, including heart stand still. It's very important that we protect your heart. We send you to the emergency room or we run EKG immediately in the clinic, in the dialysis unit, and we see if there are signs of severe potassium disarrays that have affected the heart, and then we help you to stabilize the heart. For example, if, uh, if uh, any patient is in the emergency room, we give a, a calcium injection, for instance, to stabilize the heart. And therefore, uh, I always am careful not to scare any patient because I'm myself a patient like you guys, nobody's healthy here. And, and the worst thing is to cause fear. However, we have added this statement. Let me just read it for you. High potassium can even cause a heart attack or a death. We need to be straightforward. We need to take things seriously. But when we work together, it doesn't happen. So however, we're here to tell you that a very high potassium or acutely increased potassium level could be a fatal situation. So let's work together, take it seriously, and avoid that so that we all live as long as possible. I have a patient on dialysis who has been under uh, dial, uh, undergoing dialysis for 37 years, and a lot of our patients have been 10 plus years on dialysis, and this is how we can achieve by teaming up. So next slide. Uh, so as I said, the most important thing is to measure blood level of potassium. And sadly, the only way to do it is to have a blood sample. Uh, uh, we and others have been trying to find ways into indirect uh, or, or easy measurement of potassium uh, uh, through the skin, through saliva. Sadly, they have not been successful yet. We don't give up. Hopefully, one day we'll be able to come up with uh, ways that are not invasive, but we need blood sample. That's here what's written, and we need a good blood sample because if the blood is not drawn correctly, Sometimes potassium level is erroneously high. Some of you guys have heard, it says your blood is hemolyzed. There was too many red blood cells and, and the needle, the blood draw wasn't done correctly and then we have to repeat it again. And potassium levels also vary uh, during the day or from one day to the other day based on what we eat, what we drink, how much we uh, uh, are sweating, perspiration, if we have diarrhea, we have nausea, vomiting, everything could, uh, essentially almost everything on our day-to-day -day activity could affect the level of potassium in our body fluid, in our blood. And therefore, we need to come up with a way that we know our own system. Every patient is different from another patient. And, and we need to know what I can counter and more susceptible to in terms of eating or drinking. What makes my potassium higher compared to my friend uh, John or my other friend Jane? Maybe they have a different response to potassium and put dietary potassium and potassium in terms of potassium fluctuations with uh, bowel movement and with uh, uh, sweating and other activities. So be aware of potassium variations. Next slide. Now, if you have chronic kidney disease, the most important thing that you need to do is dietary management. The key word, the name of the game is diet and food. If you have early, earlier chronic kidney disease, nowadays, in the past several years, two to three years, there is a resurgence of dietary management of chronic kidney disease in form of a low protein diet, which is coming back. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, more uh, plant-based and vegan and less meat, meat uh, less meat and more vegan diet, for example, this for earlier to moderate stages of CKD. To, and and uh, with the changes in 2020, we're moving towards more conservative, management of chronic kidney disease and deferring and delaying start of dialysis if possible, if possible. And therefore, diet is coming back. More and more nephrology centers in 2020 and beyond are going to reemphasize the keyword food and diet. 
Now, in the past, until now, diet was almost, uh, almost exclusively related to potassium when it was about uh, uh, chronic kidneys and dialysis. But uh, fortunately, the keyword diet is going to even work across a broader mandate related to chronic kidney disease. Therefore, here, potassium is also a part of diet. So if you would like to be in control for your chronic kidney disease progression, or if you're on dialysis, how you well you do, and, and differences across diet, across different stages of CKD, for example, early to moderate stage of CKD, you need lower protein. When you're on dialysis and don't make urine, you need higher protein. And, and a nephrologist, especially those who are now being trained for this new era of return of food and diet for management of kidney disease, they need to work with you and tell you what to do. And new, and new generation of dietitians are coming and, and now working on low-protein diet clinics uh, for CKD and high-protein diet uh, management of uh, uh, patients on dialysis. So all these things related to diet, therefore, you will have even more opportunity to opportunities to focus on potassium amount of diet while you're also looking at the amount of protein in the diet and salt in the diet and for those with diabetes also amount of uh, the uh, the glycemic component that means the sugar part of this and I always challenge my patients in a good way I says look if you want me to take care of you you have to show me that you take care of yourself write down what you eat every day not only write down your blood pressure every day, twice a day in the morning and the evening, I want to see what you eat. And I want to impress my dietitians, my five to eight dietitians who work with me, I want them to see that Dr. Kaltar's patients, they write down everything they eat in, and or at least several times a week or whenever they're ready to go to see the doctor so that we can see what you're eating. So do it in a way that is fun May have, have make it an interesting challenge part of your day. That look, I have chronic kidney disease. I'm writing down what I'm eating, and I have an appointment with my nephrologist next week, with my uh, dietitians, my CKD dietitian next week, and I'm writing down. I, I want to really let them know, feel them, make them feel that I am compliant here, and I have fun in in looking at my diet, and I'm very committed to nutritional management of chronic kidney disease. Next one. So in general, high potassium diet is beneficial. So that's, that's the irony. Just keep that in mind that if you hadn't had chronic kidney disease, and if you go to a diabetic clinic, if you go to a hypertension clinic, the recommendations is that eat more high potassium or potassium rich diet. And what is what are the names of those? You know that already. These are called fresh fruits and vegetables. So we're not here to say again anything against that. The the the, the diets, the the food items that have high potassium, these are mostly not all of them, but most of them are among the healthiest food items, right? So. But these are patients who don't have chronic, uh, these are people who don't have chronic kidney disease. Now, of course, in the United States, we have millions of people with chronic kidney disease, and we work with them to ensure that the diet is still healthy, heart healthy. And for CKD patients, dietary potassium restrictions are there to ensure that the level of potassium doesn't go up. So, so therefore, always remember. Don't look at potassium as a, as a poison. Don't look at the food, for example, avocado, banana, and others, that, oh, I, I cannot, I can't even look at them. No, this is misunderstanding. We, nephrologists and dietitians, we should not tell you, we have never told you, hopefully, that don't even think of uh, avocado in your entire life anymore. No, we say moderation. And and we say that have a balanced approach. Maybe less of this and more of others, but it's not 100% exclusion of these dietary items or these healthy food items. So, so we are still trying to figure out maybe we should come up with another keyword for restriction, but for now the keyword restriction should not be misunderstood. Restriction is not exclusion, right? 
So let's work together to ensure that at any level of chronic kidney disease, <clears throat> that we are not here to completely ban food items for especially these healthy food items. Next one. And uh, so with what we have understood in the past 30 to 40 years, if not longer, that the more we do research in understanding the the association of diet with potassium in the level of uh, in the blood uh, or level of potassium in the blood, the more we notice that we know less. So therefore, to be on the safe side, I'm not here to say that dietary potassium uh, that I, I did a research and I found that potassium in the diet had nothing to do with the potassium in the blood. No, that is wrong to say. We still need to be careful and conservative. <clears throat> we need to make sure that we do not leave this the wrong message that since Dr. Kalantan says potassium is healthy and healthy fresh fruits and vegetables have potassium, therefore after this lecture I'm allowed to eat more potassium. No, that's not what we are saying. We're saying that there is a lot of uh, data that suggests that in some patients, there are other factors that could affect potassium levels even more than dietary potassium. But at the end of the day, dietary potassium is still one of the uh, several factors that could determine the level of potassium in your blood, and especially if your dialysis treatment is not enough or if you're not on dialysis and we give you, we nephrologists give you medications to cause high potassium. So therefore, the one important thing that connect physicians, dietitians, and patients together is still the keyword diet. And if you have sporadic high potassium loads in the blood, blood would be di dietary controlling of potassium. And we need to figure out individually, patient centrally, what is the ideal amount for you, John, and what is the ideal amount for you, Jane. And, and there is no one size fits all. And, and that is related to the patient to come up with that uh, amount of potassium that probably is more tolerable for patient John compared to patient Jane. Next slide. So <clears throat> look at here now, how much potassium would a dietitian recommend? The Institute of Medicine, that means a panel of uh, most uh, renowned and credible experts in the United States on diet and other things. They said that a person needs 4.7 grams of potassium a day. Now, you would be surprised to know that average Americans eat less potassium. Why is that? Because potassium comes from fresh fruits and uh, uh, fruits and vegetables, and we, in, in most Western society, we don't eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, may, you may say, well, that's not a bad news for me because my doctor said uh, I don't I have to avoid potassium, but usually three to five grams of potassium a day is what is recommended for health. Now, immediately, if you look at the next uh, rows of this uh, table that I've created for you guys, it says that while, for example, I have highlighted 4.7, immediately go below that, it says two to four grams for CKD stage 3A and 4. Or over or on a New England Journal of Medicine, NEJM is a New England Journal of Medicine 2017 paper was written by myself and one of my colleagues, Dr. Fu from France. And after we review all this data, we suggested that for CKD4 and 5, should be less than 3. If your EGFR is above 30, we should still maintain normal potassium, um, I mean, the use of medicine recovering potassium. However, I should put this star and say that even if you are stage 3, if your potassium sporadically is high, then we may need to switch to the recommended amount of uh, CKD4 and 5, that means less than 3 grams of potassium. And then as to what means grams of potassium, that is where the, the dietitian is helping you. One gram of potassium is roughly 25 millimoles of potassium. And this is where you sit down. And if you're an engaged patient, you go online, you look at the literature, you you said today you, you ate half a, uh, half a uh, of avocado, when you went to Subway, for example, and that's a equivalent of five or 10 milliequivalents of potassium, and that means 0.1 grams, for example, you add up these things, and it's a lot of fun. All right, so but so in general, just remember 4.7 is for the normal person without CKD, 
And if you have advanced CKD or any CKD with having potassium surges, high surges, we recommend less than three grams. Sometimes even with more severe one, we recommend less than two grams. Next. So this is essentially the same table. I wanted just to emphasize that potassium is one of the rows out of many. You see here also there's protein, sodium, which is salt, phosphorus, which you, uh, uh, some of you, especially those on dialysis, have been bombarded with the key for phosphorus. And every month during my dialysis rounds, I come and say uh, that your phosphorus is high or your phosphorus is better. Then there is calcium issue and everything else. So it's it's amazing that you see a lot of these things have the keyword diet. That means CKD, per definition, is a diet-based management ckd management is 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 abundantly based on what you eat and how you eat and and it's even more so than diabetes or hypertension so therefore i'm very happy that 2020 is the year of nutritional and dietary management of ckd uh, and again here we emphasize less than three grams if you have advanced ckd that means a ckd that is considered uh, advanced enough to consider transitioning to dialysis or to kidney transplantation. Next one. So to show that we are on your side, we, nephrologists, a few years ago, we put together this title for a, a, an article in seminars in dialysis, Dietary Recension in Dialysis Patients. Is there anything left to eat, doctor? And don't feel ever embarrassed to ask that. Be straightforward. Ask your dietitian. Says, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 my dietitian, diet, miss dietitian, or, uh, or miss nephrologist, you're telling me don't eat this, don't eat that. Is there anything left for me to eat? Challenge your dietitian. Challenge me as your nephrologist. Pose that question because we are here to work with you. I can't go and blame you every day for your high potassium. I'm here to give you solutions. So I have to be able to tell you what to eat instead of all the time to tell you what not to eat, right? So please remember this title and go to next time in a nice way, friendly way to your dietitian and nephrology and nurses and say, look, is there anything left for me to eat? And, and do it in a smiling way, in a nice way, friendly way. And, and let them be engaged and say that you heard all uh, uh, this uh, and, uh, in the uh, American Kidney Fund and, 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 and you were recommended to engage your healthcare provider. And definitely they become more, even more interested and they will work with you. Next one. So I would like here now, you remember I said that roughly, uh, uh, about uh, how many milligrams of potassium we have or how many grams. And uh, one, uh, for example, uh, here it says a food with 250 milligrams, that means 0.25 grams of potassium per serving is considered high potassium food. So that one serving. And why per serving? Because we usually have three main servings, but in, in reality, a healthy day has five uh, 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 three main meals and th two snacks. So five opportunities to eat. Now, per serving is not per day. Remember, I said that per day, two to three grams, if your potassium is high and up to four or 4.7 grams, if potassium is normal. This is right now we're talking of per food item. We don't want that food item, let's say, uh, a, a meal with four or five, a salad bar, for example, if it has a lot of uh, avocado, I keep mentioning avocado as an example because it's among uh, the high potassium things. So you need to now become a dietitian. Once you have a CKD, you get committed to become a dietitian yourself and to look at the food and to estimate how much potassium exists in this amount. Because you remember I said that the goal, if your potassium uh, surges high, and if he said that, uh, Jane, your potassium is high, was 5.5 yesterday, 5.8 two days ago, you need to target that goal of two and a half to three grams or two to three grams of potassium and not higher than that. Then you need to know per serving and per food item how much potassium you're eating. Next one. 
And and I would like you to, uh, these are things that you all know about. If you don't know, after this lecture, sit down and review all the food items. I want you, instead of hating avocado, to respect it. Instead of hating banana, instead of saying, no, I can't even look at oranges. I, 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 I can look look at nuts. I want you to look at them, have an estimate how much potassium they have, and come up with your total daily, daily potassium yourself and make your dietitian and nephrologist happy. Next, next one. So this is the rule of two to three grams of potassium. Again, it's not for everybody, please. If you have a CKD and you don't have a potassium issue, please don't just to say that I, I looked up and, and from now on I can't eat any of these things. No, we never said that. Even for those who have high potassium, the message here is that we can work together, especially now we are in a new era with some medications that hopefully will give us more flexibility with this healthy and uh, diet and fresh fruits and vegetables. So two grams means 50 milliequivalents or millimoles. As you may hear uh, both equivalent of grams, which is milliequivalents or millimoles. So two grams is 50, three grams is 75, one gram is 25. So remember that. And sometimes you can even teach the doctors, nurses, says, look, I, I learned something. One gram of potassium is 25 millimoles or milliequivalents of potassium. Next one. So low potassium foods and drinks are those that have no more than 100 milligrams of potassium per serving. Right? I was remembering I'm not talking per day now because day <laughs> comprises a number of servings and meals, and we need now to come up with a uh, balanced approach to our day and, and to, uh, to, to enjoy healthy diet and healthy food without overdoing or underdoing during certain times or certain days. And, and the message here is your doctor and your dietitian may suggest that you eat foods that are low in potassium if you tend to have high. So we work with you and, and hopefully I never tell you don't ever eat that. I'm gonna tell you eat this in moderation. Next one. So once again, always remember, I mean, while I put a lot of uh, pictures and a lot of emphasis on fr fr fruits and vegetables, it's not just fruits and vegetables. Don't ever think that since now I, I have uh, thrown away all fresh fruits and vegetables of my kitchen, now I can go and eat a lot of uh, cheese and meat and everything. Everything has potassium. So that's another misconception that uh, only uh, these things that I keep, uh, I, I look at the pictures and all these healthy food have potassium and the other unhealthy food don't have potassium. I'm going to do that, and I shouldn't say even unhealthy food, but I'm saying that the the healthier foods are food items are not the only one that have potassium. So here you see now uh, the uh, uh, list of non uh, things that are not necessarily fresh fruits and vegetables, and yet they have also potassium. But these they have less potassium. Now anything in excess means high potassium. So if you go, go around and eat a lot of uh, protein, that also increases potassium level. So please. Therefore, take advantage of the balance and, and, and uh, moderate uh, moderation-based uh, uh, approach. Next one. Now, what about uh, patients keep asking me since uh, uh, one or two years ago that they heard in, uh, that, uh, that like phosphorus binders are not potassium binders. Yes, actually, there are potassium binders. Actually, one of them has been around for 30 plus years. You have heard so many times, K exhalate, if somebody has gone to emergency room and potassium was high, we gave you something to, to drink. It's like a milky uh, uh, or chalky uh, sort of a, a, a shot, or sometimes it's used in other forms. And that's, that was already sort of a potassium binder. Now there are pills, actually, similar to phosphorus binders. And, and, and these are recently FDA approved, I mean, Food and Drug Agency has approved them, so they are available in the United States. Uh, they can be prescribed by your doctors, but uh, we still are working on different research projects to see if they can give me more flexibility and freedom to enjoy more fresh fruits and vegetables with high potassium. The answer is we don't know yet, all right? 
we're hoping to go to that direction. Hopefully soon uh, we'll have more of these studies done and, and more data to share with you. If the, uh, the potassium binders would allow us uh, to be even more flexible and have more leverage in terms of diet. So these are coming, have been around, and more data will be available. Next one. Now, other medications. Now, this is a slide I used to teach young doctors and others. So, therefore, you see some uh, names and, and uh, say, so what is, for example, Rossi? Uh, RASI or ACE and ARE. This is some medication that uh, many of the, many patients have been on called Losartan, a lisinopril. That increases potassium. What's an NSAID? These are patient. These are uh, medication used for pain. Beta blocker, for example, this is your metoprolol. If I increase the dose higher and higher, it could cause potassium. What is trimetoprim? That's your bacterium. If I give you bacterium, for example, for your infection. So therefore, and calcineurin feeds a cyclosporine program, tacrolimus for those who have had kidney transplant. So I, doctor, I have caused a surge in your potassium. And I should, I should admit that and I should educate you. I said, look, uh, uh, Miss... Uh, Smith, I'm giving you these medications that will lead to increasing potassium level, and I should work with you on that instead of saying that the only reason your potassium is high is because you eat too much potassium. So therefore, another one is that you work with your nephrologist and your other patients to identify medications that could cause high potassium, and then work with your doctors not to delete them, not to exclude them, not to avoid them, but to come up with that knowledge and how if you take higher dose of some of these medications, to be careful that potassium level could be higher. Next one. So in summary, key takeaway, takeaway messages. Manage potassium through diet and medicine combined. It is not one. It's not just diet. And hopefully after this lecture, you also don't go to your uh, nephrosis that this is only because of the medication. It's, these are all different factors that lead to variability and, and fluctuations in potassium. Take potassium binders as prescribed, as I said, the same way that we have worked with you on phosphorus binders for the past 20 to 30 years. Now, with the emergence of potassium binders, we're going to work with you to see if uh, these binders could help better control potassium levels and uh, talk to your doctor or doctors and dietitian and healthcare provider, providers about med medicines that you're taking that may affect your potassiums, be aware of them uh, without uh, 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 being too much concerned that uh, why my doctor is giving to me, uh, not, uh, we don't. And, give you a, a, any medication to cause harm. These are medications that are given to you and nothing is without any adverse events. But if a medication is unnecessary as causing higher potassium, such as lysinopril and losartan, then we need to be even more careful and more aware of uh, other uh, source of potassium load. And finally, work with your doctor and dietitian uh, and uh, dietitians and other healthcare providers to create a potassium management plan that works best for you, not for uh, uh, another person, but for you. You are the center of all these managements, and you are different than others. Come up, work, be under control, work with, with your healthcare providers, be in control. Uh, I think uh, this was the last slide. Am I? Let's see if there's another slide. If not, I really would like to appreciate the time. Or oh, here, actually, there are resources. American Kidney Fund, to uh, its credit, is one of the most credible entities. I would like to encourage all patients, patient groups, patient family members, work with these amazing people in American Kidney Fund. They have worked hard ever since I became a young nephrologist 20 years ago, and since now, they have been around for two decades. I've always enjoyed educational activities and resources on American Kidney Fund and their commitment to helping patients being patient-centric. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kalantar. Um, before we dive into the Q&A section, I just want to re-emphasize some of these materials that are part of our Beyond Bananas campaign. Um, we had several questions that came in asking things like, are there patient-friendly tools that list the level of potassium in foods? Or are there tools to help keep track of foods that are low and high in potassium? And we actually have those tools available on our website. If you go to kidneyfund.org slash beyondbananas, we have a potassium food guide that lists low, medium, and high potassium foods. And we also have a potassium tracker that you can use each day to track the amount of potassium you intake, as well as log when you're taking your potassium binder. So, you're welcome to submit your questions now. But for those of you who have already submitted them, Dr. Kalantar, let's get into some of these questions and answer them. Um, so our first question is, um, are there, do you have any advice for someone who has a plant-based plant -based diet who is trying to limit their potassium? Uh, okay, well, uh, can you repeat the name of diet? A plant-based diet, so like oh, a plant -based vegan diet. diet. Or yeah, plant -based diet. yeah, that's a good thing because, uh, uh, you know, some of the patients, they come and say, tell me that, look, I want to be vegetarian and, and uh, I'm so disappointed that uh, uh, telling me that actually I can be because now I have chronic kidneys. I said, I tell them, no, that's wrong. That's also another misconception. First of all, we just said that there are different types of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables with different levels of potassium. That's number one. Number two, even the highest amount of potassium, how many times did you hear I mentioned the keyword avocado? Why? Because avocado is on top of the line of highest potassium level per amount of per grams of uh, if, if, uh, vegetable. So even that one is not banned. But we say that try to switch, go <clears throat> sit down with your dietitian, look at the items, the plant-based diet, uh, the plant plant-based foods and items, and identify those that have less potassium and eat and, and try to change your approach to, uh, to still do not necessarily exclude those with high potassium, but make this less frequent and, and switch to more frequent items with less potassium, all right? And, and this is where it's the fun starts. Look at it as fun instead of looking at it as restriction. And look at it as a challenge. And I want even to emphasize those who would like to be plant-based, especially on top of that, when you have chronic kidney disease in 2020 and beyond, you will notice if you have earlier to moderate stage chronic kidney disease, nowadays we say low protein, diet with at least half of it being from plant-based. So therefore, plant-based diet is, was, is, and will remain the cornerstone of dietary management of kidney disease. And I'm very happy that this question uh, was, was mentioned because I'd like to emphasize plant-based diet uh, should remain and should be emphasized, and, and your dietitians, in fact, there, there's going to be in 2020 and, uh, and beyond, it will be more fun to work with you to ensure that that happens. And, and then on top of that, as we mentioned during the last two or three slides about the role of uh, potassium binders that will hopefully help you, help us to have more leverage here. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, so our next question is, this person says, I am living with a kidney transplant. Should I continue to control my potassium intake? Okay, so the answer is, it all depends. When you have a kidney transplant, essentially it's CKD earlier to moderate stage based on how well the kidney transplant is doing. Usually a kidney transplant patient is a kind of CKD is stage three and four. And if based on medications that we're giving you, if I'm, I'm for example, giving you cyclosporin or Prograf, Tacrolimus, that, these medications also increase potassium level in the blood. And again, it goes back to the general uh, recommendation to, to adopt a moderate, a moderation-based approach to the diet. So check your potassium in, during your monthly uh, uh, transplant visits, or if you go nowadays, uh, you're very well established and you go to the transplant clinic to your nephrology every three months, see what the level of potassium is, and, and ask your doctor, that's a doctor, are there, is there a way uh, 
to also adjust the medication? And can you send me to the, the dietitian that is uh, focusing on, on, on transplant patients? And dietitian or that new dietitian, new generation of dietitians are now going to emerge this year and next year will focus on chronic kidney disease, not just dialysis. So the short, the final answer is that yes, if you have a kidney transplant, you need to watch your potassium level, and and uh, if it is mostly on the higher side, especially above 5.1 or 5.3, you need also to work with the dietitians and with the nephrologists to identify if there are causes coming from medications. As I said, the uh, immunosuppressive medication we cannot discontinue because we want that kidney to last as long as possible. But uh, uh, consider also work with your uh, nephrologist to see if uh, some of the potassium binders could help you, as well as uh, working with your dietitians. Thank you. That's great advice. So our next question says, I am on a medicine for my heart condition, which can increase my potassium levels. How can I deal with kidney disease and heart disease at the same time? Yes, that's another important question because uh, 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 I said that medications that are given for kidney disease as well as heart disease, I should have added that, not infrequently we give you certain medications, for example, called spironolactone, efrerinone. These also lead to high potassium levels. And, and the answer is yes, we need to, sometimes we have no choice but to give you this medication, similar to a kidney transplant patient, similar to a lysine or losartan and all these medications, they all lead to increasing potassium levels or, or lowering the ability of kidneys to uh, excrete potassium. And therefore, you still need to find that moderation approach. That means identify food items with less potassium. And, and again, I'm hoping that uh, I've seen a, a number of uh, cardiologists nowadays, they give these medications along with potassium binders to the patient. So, and we are looking forward to those data coming and telling us how uh, these potassium binders have allowed us to use these medications. That means the heart medications and the kidney medications even more effectively without having the fear of high potassium in the blood. Great explanation. Um, so we have a question from a healthcare provider. They said, how can I help improve a patient's lab, especially potassium? Yes, uh, and that's a good question. I think uh, these are all excellent questions so far, and and uh, and we need to also feel that uh, while we would like to have a good number in front of our eyes, uh, not infrequently uh, your dietitian in dialysis units, your nurse practitioner in the ambulatory clinic, uh, they feel they, they are scrutinized if patient's potassium is high. So uh, I'm just telling you the 10-second story. Some of my dietitians sometimes come to my office and cry. I says, Dr. Kalantar, potassium levels on more patient this month is high, and, and I, I feel I'm guilty for that. And I tell my dietitians, so don't ever feel guilty about this. Let's work together. So at the same time, don't feel pressure that we want our patients to have good numbers. It's not a report card. And, and uh, we should not be scrutinized. You should never feel bad if this month's potassium levels in, the, in this dialysis unit or that dialysis unit is higher than last month. And, and we work together. Let's go back to the patient and tell the patient that, look, maybe this month you have more 5.3 and let's say our, our uh, target was 5.1 in this dialysis unit and we have more patients with 5.3, but it's not extremely high. and and work together with all these things that I said here, we are not here to treat pure number. We are here to treat the patient, Jane and John, all right? We are not here doctors or dietitians for some blood test. And let's be patient-centric and work together. So, so numbers are important, but I would like to ask patients also at the, for uh, answering this question with one more keyword is the trending. Look at the trend. One potassium uh, uh, doesn't mean anything. Sit down, write down all your potassium levels. If it's monthly in a dialysis unit, if it's tri-monthly in CKD clinic or heart failure clinic or diabetes clinic, write down and see what your trend has been in the past 
12 months, 24 months. And the trend is much more important than one single level. That's wonderful advice. Um, so I know we're almost at time, so I'll ask one last question. Um, could you please address some of the side effects of potassium binders? Yes, these are uh, essentially based on uh, what which potassium binders. Usually potassium binders, that means these are uh, very similar to phosphorus binders. They bind potassium inside your belly. That means when you eat potassium in your stomach and your gastrointestinal tract, your intestine, they go after potassium, they bind it, they trap it, and then it becomes part of the bowel movement, right? Instead of being absorbed inside the, through your system going to the blood. And therefore, anything that works that way, and you have seen that with KX, sometimes it may cause some GI tract issues, so, so some sort of uh, diarrhea, constipation. It could go either way. Uh, some of them could cause a little bit of uh, fluid retention. Sometimes it could also affect certain things. So my suggestion is to read the package insert and don't overread that. Every medication you read the package insert of, uh, initially, it's a little bit scary. I said, wow, there's so many problems. Well, that is the policy of the United States F FDA agency to ensure that you know everything. So I know it's scary, but every medication has a long list of potential problems. I still encourage you, so in addition to certain GI <coughs> uh, 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 feelings or, or maybe uh, fluid retention, if that could could or may not even happen, uh, see how it works for you. And, and then work with your physician to toward to explaining those and say that, look, I have these symptoms now after this. Is it from this medication, from uh, potassium bond or something else? And, and then the dose will be adjusted. And hopefully this is essentially a new era. We are learning together. And uh, uh, and will make this medication also uh, work out for you as uh, similar to many other medications uh, uh, we have been working together as a team with you as the patient. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Kalantar, and for leading such an excellent webinar. So this concludes today's webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website kidneyfund.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. Our next webinar will be about caregiving and how you can navigate kidney-friendly cooking. The webinar will be held on Wednesday, February 19th and hosted by Chef Linda Blaylock, a culinary expert and CKD caregiver. Registration is now open. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again.